the things that came from Winter Hill. Forward by Philip Anforth, son of Richard. My name is Philip Gerald Anforth. I'm sixty-five years of age, and live in the remote village of Felmont, Lancashire, on the edge of the West Pennine Moors. My father, Richard Anforth, sadly passed away at the end of November 2018, at the ripe old age of ninety-one. He was a quiet man, but a stalwart of the community. His name and reputation as a dedicated woodsman, known throughout the surrounding boroughs and neighbouring towns. But as I say, he was a reserved character. The details of his personal life a mystery to all who knew him, even his nearest and dearest. So naturally, after his passing last month, I, his only surviving relative, was eager to peruse the contents of a cabinet he'd kept under lock and key for as long as I can remember and following my discovery therein, I felt it prudent to chronicle both the find itself and my thoughts on the matter here upon these pages. I'm not much of a writer, and so I'll dispense with any attempt to add colour to what is already a rather colourful tale. I'll present my findings just as I found them. My father lived in a rather substantial property in the centre of Felmont, if you were to view the village's main thoroughfare, Winter A Lane, on a map, you'd see that the street intersects the village from northeast to southwest. Forking northwest from Winter A Lane, you'd see the cul de sac Stump Row. My father's farmhouse, Stump Cottage, is the first southwest facing property on the right as you enter the cul de sac. It has been in the family for generations. In brief, the farmhouse comprises two reception rooms, a study, and a kitchen on the ground floor and four bedrooms, a bathroom, and a landing with access to a loft space on the first floor. As you enter the property on the ground floor, the study is the first room you come upon on the immediate left. My father kept the locked cabinet in there. Which brings me to the subject of the key. My father always wore a necklace, attached to the end of which was a small brass key. I always suspected the key belonged to the cabinet in the study, and I even questioned him about it once or twice over the years, but he always refused to discuss it. And though I was tempted once or twice, especially in my younger years, I respected him much too greatly to have it off him in the night. The key in the cabinet were his. Whatever he had tucked away in there was his business. But I was forever curious about it. Many a time I'd contemplated forcing the cabinet open— it was more of a bureau, really. Solid mahogany, with a number of hinges I was sure could easily be unscrewed and carefully removed. But despite these urges, I was still unwilling to betray his wishes in such an aggressive manner. Following his death last month, his last will and testament clearly stipulated the key was to be placed in my possession. And, as you might have guessed, I wasted no time in opening that locked cabinet. It took a great deal of wiggling and jiggling to work that lock. It was evident my father hadn't been near the thing in decades. Whatever the old thing contained, my father hadn't wished to address it while he still drew breath. When the locking mechanism finally yielded to my efforts, the sturdy wooden doors opened outwards, revealing a barren interior, with the exception of a small wooden box. I opened the box and discovered two items inside. The first item was a journal of sorts, handwritten by my father. The second item, well, logic dictates that I should probably relate the contents of the journal before discussing that. The journal, well preserved but a little tattered round the edges, appeared to consist of twelve diary entries, chronicling events between December 26, 1957 and January 6, 1958, the twelve days of Christmas, no less. There were no entries prior to the 26th, and none following the 6th of January. I quickly realised that something of great importance had happened over those twelve days, and my father, whom I had never known to keep a diary or to make notes of any description, had felt it so important, of such 
potentially dangerous significance, that he'd felt the need to chronicle it and lock it away. How much of it is accurate, I can't be certain, as it's noted in the first entry that at least a couple of months had elapsed before he took the decision to pen his story. Rather than reiterate my father's words and risk muddying the waters, I'm going to present the journal here in full as he penned it, a tale so bizarre and utterly surreal that I can feel the hairs on the back of my neck begin to tingle as I prepare to transcribe it. And when I'm done with the diary entries, I'll be in a much better position to address that other thing I found in that wooden box. Here it is, the journal of Mr. Richard Peter Anforth. Entry 1, Thursday, December 26th, 1957. I suppose I'm going to have to write an introduction of some sort. First things first, I'm no wordsmith. In fact, the world only sees my penmanship when I scrawl a signature on the face of a sales receipt or a dear so-and-so on the envelope of a Christmas card. And even then, it's usually Murray who takes care of all that. Murray's my wife, you see. Bloody hell, I'm, I'm already rambling, because I don't really know how to begin. In any case, my name is Richard Peter Anforth, woodsman by trade, married to Murray for over a decade, father of Philip. It's for little Philip's sake I've decided to write all this up. But for as long as me and Murray live, this here account will be out of his reach. And there's a good reason for that, too. I imagine the bloke Philip came to know as his father was quite different to the geezer doing his best to string sentences together in this here book. And that's because of what we went through last Christmas. An ordeal I'm still struggling to come to terms with. An ordeal that Murray will never fully recover from. I'm just thankful Philip was too young to appreciate what went on. For the record, I'm writing this on March 13th, 1958. I'll try to start at the beginning. Things first took a turn for the strange on Boxing Day, which, as I've stated above, was a Thursday. Boxing Day is usually a quiet day up here in Felmont. Folks amble about with dogs in the morning. By the gazebo on Rosemary Street, there's talk of who cooked the plumpest and juiciest turkey, and by lunchtime most people are in the Wailing Willow, supping ale or mulled wine with a mince pie. But things didn't start out in the usual manner that Thursday. I think I crawled out of bed around 7.30am, which, I might add, was quite the lie-in for me, perhaps the result of one too many sherries the previous evening. I popped the kettle on the ob, dropped a tea bag into a cup, and wandered into the living room to open the curtains. There had been heavy snowfall overnight, and a slight dusting continued before my eyes. But it wasn't the sight of the glorious icing sugar lawn that kept me from returning to the kitchen when the kettle started whistling. No, it was the sight of a tall, thin, pale fella stumbling in and out of the road across the street. I hollered to Mary to take care of the kettle and rushed out into the cold to see to the stranger. My neighbour across the street, Paycock, had noticed the man too, and together we approached him in our dressing gowns. Fortunately, Stump Row is a cul-de-sac, and so the bloke wasn't in any immediate danger from passing traffic. Not that he would have been on Winter Air Lane either, not at that time of year. From his tracks in the snow, we quickly deduced that he'd wandered onto Stump Row from the old hills, which, I have to say, troubled me no end. The immediate countryside surrounding Felmont, chiefly woods and moorland, can be dangerous over winter. We're talking old mine shafts, bottomless pits, hidden ravines, you name it. Under a blanket of snow, that terrain presents many a hazard, not to mention what lies beyond the Wilder's Wood, but I'll come back to that. Anyhow, this chap who had wandered into the village from God only knows where was as pale as they come, practically blue in the face, and though he was dressed from head to toe in what appeared to be decent winter wear, the stranger had the most aggressive case of the shivers I've ever seen. His teeth were chattering so violently that the poor bugger had punctured both his bottom lip and his tongue. A dark red streak of blood coated his chin. I tell you, he looked just like that Nosferatu, whiter than the snow he were. Paycock saw to him immediately, 
He said the fire was roaring at his place, and so we dragged the feller inside and planted him in front of it. Paycock's wife, Joan, brought the bloke a warm tea cloth and washed some of that mess away from his chin. But he kept on shivering, softly moaning, and his eyes, though open and stirring, never seemed to focus on anything. If it weren't for that incessant trembling, you'd have mistaken him for a statue. The phone lines aren't too reliable in Felmont, especially over the dark season, as we call it, and so Paycock sent his eldest, Billy, over to Grundy Street to fetch Dr. Brown. And the old time we waited, that lad simply gazed at the flames, but not seeing them, lost in his own head, I reckon. We tried to coax a story out of him, but he was away with the furries, up on cloud nineteen, no doubt. Mary popped her head in, inquired as to what was going on, took one look at the frozen fella, and was back across the street before I could open me mouth. I tell you, she didn't like the look of that man one bit. Dr. Brown soon arrived, Billy at his rear like a loyal sheepdog, and he examined the stranger. The lad's shakes had departed him for the time being, but that inane glow persisted. You would have thought he'd crawled out of a lake of ice and into a cauldron of fire. His skin had begun to blister. The doc said it was frostbite. He whipped the lad's gloves off, and the tips of his fingers were in a similar state. Brown said that in all probability it was likely that the lad had been out drinking in one of the neighbouring villages, wandered out of the pub in a bit of a drunken stupor, stumbled into the woods, and, somehow, managed to survive the night by wandering in and out of the wilder's wood, sheltered by the trees. I frowned at that, but I accepted it as a valid explanation, despite the fact that there was something about the geezer that didn't sit right with me. Granted, he must have been scared out there in the dark, but the look on his face suggested more than that. I can't explain how it affected me. Brown pledged to stay with the stranger till transport could be arranged to take him to the infirmary in Bolton. Me and Paycock stood in the kitchen, whispering conspiratorially for a while over several cups of tea. Occasionally we glanced in the direction of the stranger near the open fireplace in the living room. Brown might as well have been attending a shop mannequin. I thanked Paycock for the cuppa and headed back across the street, leaving him and Brown to it. A couple of hours later, Paycock came knocking and told me that the lad had been transported to Bolton Royal. Brown's final word on the stranger's condition was that he had entered a state of mild catatonia or was suffering from temporary amnesia. Regardless, the chap hadn't said a word, and, to my knowledge, has remained that way to this day. Afterwards, me and Paycock headed to the Willow, where, I can tell you, we were the centre of attention for a little while. The usual four or five punters, the cobbler Derek Smith included, hungry for gossip. We told them what we knew, and spoke of our concerns regarding the chap's origins. None of us really believed that he could have made it from the nearest town to Felmont overnight. It's a good ten miles as the crow flies in any direction. Over the summer months, one can hike the trails with relative ease, but over winter, during a snowstorm, in temperatures below freezing, inebriated, well, I suppose anything is possible. Blind luck in this case. But there was something else that didn't sit right with me. Something I caught a glimpse of when Brown removed the fella's gloves. Something around the wrist. Was that thing glowing? If the doc saw it, he never mentioned it. And if the staff at Bolton Royal saw it, they've kept it to themselves too. And so the rest of the day played out as it usually does. I left the pub at tea time, tucked into a plethora of turkey sandwiches courtesy of Murray, and, if I recall correctly, we, we played dominoes till just after 9pm. Then we hit the sack. Murray fell asleep immediately. I, however, was plagued with visions of the pale man. Just who was he? Where had he come from? Entry 2, Friday, December 27th, 1957 Somehow, stranger things were about to occur. <laughs> 
The 27th of December conducts itself much like Boxing Day. The only work being done is the tending of the bar down at the Wailing Willow, and the clearing of the streets by Mick Naylor's tractor, if the snowfall has been heavy enough. And that particular December 27th started out as just one of those days. I walked to the sound of Big Mick's tractor at approximately 6am. He'd just done a sweep of the cul-de-sac, not out of necessity, mind, but out of courtesy. I made myself a cup of tea. The rest of the household was dead to the world, and went out for a stroll along Winter Ray Lane. It was a cold, dark morning, naturally, but a thorough coating of snow adds a certain luminescence to a place, and so, when my winter boots pulled up to my knees, I was able to crunch my way along the empty walkways with little difficulty. I tipped my hat in Big Mick's direction as he passed me on the tractor, but the old bugger didn't see me. My mind was overwrought with visions of the pale man the old hills had delivered to us. As I pen this thing, I'll continually try to elaborate on Felmont folklore, as I'm not sure how one's perspective of the place will have changed in years to come. I've always felt that strangeness belongs to the time, rather than the location. In considering these old hills, it's important to remember that in those ancient times before the advent of agriculture and civilization, the woods and moorland beyond were known only to the birds, the wolf packs, and the nomads. Your average hunter-gatherer might have gazed upon this place with a sense of wonder, drawn to the woods and open plains in search of game. Over time, though, the place developed something of a reputation. When and exactly how this was established, it's difficult to say. Perhaps it's folk memory, or the collective consciousness thing we sometimes hear about these days, that inspired my predecessors. And though my dad and his dad before him were modern men, they would sit before an open fire just like those primitive men of old, and muse over the peculiar nature of Winter Hill, the plateau above the foothills. Like most other Felmonters, I've never dared stray beyond the further boundaries of the acreage belonging in the west to the Nailers, and in the north to the Calderbanks, and as events transpired over those twelve days, it would be the eldest surviving member of the latter family that would shed further light on the nature of what may in fact be sitting above the forest we call the Wilder's Wood. But I digress. As I walked in a northerly direction towards High Bank, I visualised the face of the pale man— the peculiar chap who had allegedly wandered in and out of the Wilder's Wood in a snowstorm, drunk and lost. I just couldn't wrap my head around it. I turned, gazed northwest, and was just able to make out the tree line, high above the village, set against a backdrop of pure white haze. Winter Hill loomed over Felmont, as it always had, and I shuddered. I crunched my way back along the snowy footpath, and was home around 8 a.m. Mary was in the kitchen, a tea-stained apron about her midriff, armed with a rolling pin. The first batch of bread was already baking in the oven. I have to tell you, the smell of baking bread on a snowy December morning is sensational. Fills the heart with a headiness not quick to depart. Scrambled eggs on toast by the fire. <laughs> Marvellous! The morning sped by as I saw to a number of chores in the backyard mainly the chopping of wood for the fire, and the clearing of snow from the footpath. By noon, I was feeling a little roiled, and was eager to get down to the Wailing Willow to wet my whistle. I stepped into the pub just after 1pm, only to find the place practically deserted. I ordered myself a pint and talked to Chapman, the landlord, who was busy serving up shot after shot a single malt for the local drunk, Baxter. He's something of a legend in these parts. You can't miss the old fellow when you're out and about. He's forever up and down Winter Air Lane on his bike, heading to and from the Willow. Murray joined me just after 2pm, and we had Helen, Chapman's wife, serve us up turkey and chips. It was just as I was laying down my knife and fork and giving my belly a good rub that I heard something unusual outside. We all heard it. Before I tell you exactly what it was that we heard— Allow me to tell you a little bit about the pub and its name. 
The Wailing Willow is named after the large tree that stands on the grounds behind the main building. As you approach the pub on High Bank, the willow can be seen towering over the pub, its limbs gently clawing at the slates and chimney pots. It stands on the edge of the wilder's wood, right where the foothills begin to ascend interminably towards Winter Hill. In times gone by, the locals, my dad included, referred to the willow as the gatekeeper, and beyond a sort of trail through the wilder's wood as the tunnel. The bravest of kids back in the day would dare each other to approach the gatekeeper, to stand in its shadowy clutches for thirty seconds or more. To approach the tunnel beyond was to earn yourself the coveted title of madman. To enter the tunnel, well, that rarely, if ever, happened. They called the trail through the wilder's wood the tunnel, because it was said that if the wind atop Winter Hill was blowing just right, that it would wind its way down through the forest, exhausting itself in the myriad boughs and leaves of the gatekeeper. This wind, as it passed through the willow, would result in a low piping, a discord, as Bobby Trafford, the church organist, once referred to it. And so it mustn't be too difficult to guess what it was we heard outside on that fateful December afternoon. The gatekeeper wailed, a sort of anguished, dissonant cry heard only in nightmares, akin to hundreds of disembodied voices flowing in and out of the naked limbs and spurs, not a single leaf or bird nest remaining to stifle it. We rushed outside, every last one of us. The wailing was sustained. It rose into a crescendo, sharpened by the glistening snow decorating the gatekeeper's branches. Murray put her hands over her ears. Chapman winced. Baxter wheezed. I simply gazed, astonished. A couple walking up from Winter A Lane simply stood frozen in place, their eyes and ears fixed upon the old tree, attuned to its anguish. Eventually it stopped, not abruptly, mind, but sort of faded to a whisper. And in that moment, I think we all wondered what had stirred up on Winter Hill, what had moved or shifted up there to create such a potent gust of unearthly wind. Heading back into the Wailing Willow, Chapman, a man of seventy years, related tale after tale that had been passed down to him through the generations. Tales of mist folk and goblins, goat men and snowhounds, the little men of County Bravadus, and a dozen other things and notions totally foreign to me. But it was old Baxter's tale that won out. He said he'd heard the gatekeeper's cry on Christmas Day. He'd just finished pulling on his thickest gloves, straddled his old bike in a drunken stupor, and then the tree called to him, as he put it. He said it cried in such a wistful, devastating tone that he was off in a flash, home and under the covers before he could take his boots off. Was the cry a precursor to the arrival of the pale man? And the gatekeeper had wailed once more, would the morning of the 28th see another stranger brought to Felmont? Entry 3, Saturday, December 28th, 1957 Would the morning of the 28th bring another visitor to Felmont? The answer to my question was yes. But when we found the second stranger, he was dead. The youngest of the Chapmans, Boris, grey-eyed, a little slow, found the fella early on. Couldn't have missed it, really. The body was lying in the middle of the road, some thirty or so paces south of the Wailing Willow. It hadn't snowed the previous evening, and the biting frost had preserved the stranger's footprints, chronicling an awkward shamble, a route we traced to the gatekeeper, and beyond, towards the tunnel. The second stranger was a thirty-something hiker. As was the case with the first man, the individual had been adorned in hardy outdoor gear, thick, fur-lined overcoat, heavy-duty boots, thermal gloves, and so on. He carried nothing on his person, no wallet, no identification of any kind, just the man and the threads on his back. When I heard of the discovery of the second stranger, I don't know what disturbed me more the notion of a frozen body on high bank. 
or the fact that the figure had emerged from the Wilder's Wood. What else can I tell you about Felmont folklore? England's northwest has had its fair share of ghouls and goblins over the centuries. You can't wander through these parts without hearing talk of the Pendle Witches or the Spooks of Shingle Hall. But there's something else on these here moors. A presence. Something supernatural. Perhaps this presence, or whatever you might prefer to call it, is the result of some weird topography, some electromagnetic disturbance, or of certain undefinable properties beyond our understanding. I'm not too literate in these respects, but literate or not, I suspect the phenomenon has its source atop Winter Hill. Winter Hill is what we call the plateau atop these earmores, a plateau some ten or so miles squared, infamously inaccessible, owing to the incredible, boggy, cragged, and unsurpassable terrain of the lower foothills, home to the Wilderswood, the Devil's Bridge, Hardstone Crags, and so on. Folks who claim to have walked atop the plateau tell conflicting tales, and are often quickly exposed for the frauds they are. As Chapman inferred the day before, creatures great, small, and terrible are rumoured to roam up there. In days gone by, would-be hunters passed the gatekeeper, seeking the most direct route to the plateau via the tunnel. But few ever return with a sufficient complement of marbles to tell a convincing story. It was the wind, they would say, the wind that drove them back. The very wind we now know to be the lungs beneath the cries of the willow. More than once my late dad spoke of those who had supposedly gazed across the plateau, but those tales were lacking too. Although I have to admit, Chapman's mist folk claims could account for the veil of fog more than one storyteller has said hangs in the air up there. But more often than not, stories pertaining to Winter Hill are always regarded as simply that stories. As a boy, I would ask my dad why a scout party hadn't been assembled, to hike to the edge of the plateau and properly survey the land. And in response he would say it just wasn't worth the trouble, that the land was impractical, beyond cultivation, that the journey was dangerous, unjustifiable. For the longest time, I accepted what he said, but not blindly, because, it has to be said, when you grow up in a small village, and you're spoon-fed local folklore and superstition from an early age, you have to question whether or not the community in general knows more about what's going on than they're willing to admit. More than once growing up, I had the feeling the older generations were hiding something from us younger inhabitants, despite the tidbits I obtained from my dad and grandad. Could it be that folks like Chapman, my father, Big Mick Taylor, Old man Calderbank and even Dr. Brown knew something of the reality of Winterill, knew that the bleak plateau was in fact much more accessible than they were leading us younger folks to believe? Was it possible that the tunnel through the Wilderswood carried more than just wind through its ancient trees and walkways every day? Of course, now, speaking in the present, I have to cling to the notion that my suspicions were baseless— just the idle thoughts of a fella spooked by a most unlikely series of events. They couldn't have known what was about to happen, could they? Entry 4, Sunday, December 29th, 1957 It was Sunday the 29th when the third visitor came stumbling into the village. Whether the Wailing Willow had warned of the arrival the night before, None were in its presence to confirm nor deny. First came the pale man, then the dead man, now came the rambling man. This fellow, though frozen to the core, was found wandering the length of winter air lane in the early hours, babbling incoherently to himself. Like those who came before him, he wore thick winter clothing, but carried little, if anything, about his person. The most noticeable difference with the rambling man was that he seemed to be in considerable pain. A nasty gash about his midriff suggested that he had been attacked by something, something large. Back then, despite the legends, 
I didn't really believe wolves and other dangerous creatures were prowling atop Winter Hill, but the claw marks we found on that fella's belly did appear to be canine in origin. Jack Robbins, the youngest of the butcher Carl Robbins's brood, had persuaded the Apples victim to go with him to Dr. Brown's place, where he could receive at least the cursory attention he needed, prior to being whipped off to Bolton Royal. Again, Brown patched him up as best he could, whilst listening to the fella ramble on and on about the thing that attacked him in the mist, the thing that forced him off the trail, the thing that shambled just out of sight, the thing that he had grown aware of during a hike through the snowy hills. But just who the rambling man was, where he had come from, and where he had been heading to, Brown and young Jack never learned. As had been the case with the pale man, he was transported to Bolton Royal, and placed under their care. Again, this fella never recovered. To this day he's never been able to talk about anything other than that mysterious attack on the moors. A pattern was emerging. Folk were wandering out into the wilderness, losing their way, and succumbing to all manner of weird ailments and unprovoked attacks. But I still couldn't figure out how on earth the strangers were finding their way up onto the moors in the first place. I thought back to the stories concerning the Wailing Willow, a.k.a. the Gatekeeper, the mysteries surrounding the trail through the Wilder's Wood, a.k.a. the Tunnel, and the strange discord when the wind blew just right. Was the wail of the willow really a warning, or was it suggestive of something else, something beyond our comprehension up there beyond the Wilder's Wood, atop the bleak moorland of Winter Hill? Later that same evening, I popped over to Brown's place, to try to learn what I could about the rambling man. The tidbits I'd picked up that afternoon, naturally, were collected over a pint or two at the Wailing Willow. Young Jack Robbins never showed his face, and so a visit to the docks was my only option. Brown, visibly shaken, was more than happy to invite me in to share an Irish coffee with him. You see, like me, he was beginning to see the pattern emerging, and felt the inevitable burden of responsibility upon his shoulders should further strangers wander into the village in various states of disrepair. I pressed him on the subject of the rambling man, and was surprised to learn that the fellow had shared certain details with the doctor. For example, the chap repeatedly made reference to the Zark, an area of wetland some three or four miles west of Winter Hill. It would appear the stranger had crossed the Zark in the direction of the Wilderswood, before losing his way in the forest. Brown was as surprised as I was by this detail, as the Zark is notoriously difficult to negotiate. The vast majority of its acreage comprises peat bogs and stagnant pools. The closest community to the Zark is the village of White Moss on its westmost perimeter, and over the years we had all heard the tales of White Moss dog walkers who had been rescued at the eleventh hour following plunges into quagmires, and not to mention the tales of those who had never been found. And so for this walker to have negotiated the Zark in the winter snow, it seemed incredible. And that wasn't the only thing the fellow mentioned. He spoke of a structure in the hills, a towering landmark he saw beyond the veils of mist, a beacon he used to navigate the boggy terrain. But then his rambling would turn to the thing that had stalked him, and, according to Brown, he would work himself up into a frenzy, babbling incessantly, before calming, and then the whole thing would start all over again, with him referring to his hike across the Zark. It seemed to Brown that these visitors were losing something up there on the moors, losing a piece of what it was that made them who they were, that made them able to remember who they were, and what had happened to them. And to me that made the whole thing that much worse. What on earth would happen next? Entry 5. Monday, December 30th, 1957. Now, I've spoken of the Calderbanks, the name up here in Felmont going back generations— 
Norman Calderbank was the last of the family line, and at the time of the strangeness, the old geezer was up into his nineties. Something of a recluse he was, still managing to work the land he'd inherited decades earlier, keen to keep out of the affairs of others. Calderbank's land and farmhouse lies at the end of a dirt track off Winter Air Lane, northeast of High Bank. Reserved though the old fellow was, he'd been a good friend of my late grandad's, and I figured he'd be a good person to talk to regarding recent events. I made my way up to his homestead on the morning of the thirtieth. He must have been expecting me, for there he was on the front porch, gazing out across the fresh snowfall that had bewitched his expansive lawns. For a chap in his nineties, old Calderbank was a sprightly fellow. He stood a good six feet despite his crooked back, and his arms, though sinewy, still held a good deal of strength. His grizzled face was one to be old that morning. A strange look of determination pasted across it. He greeted me in that inimitable way only folk born in the nineteenth century can. It was more of a grunt than the expected pleasantry, but it held a degree of friendliness that I hadn't expected. I mean, it hadn't been more than a couple of months since I'd last conversed with him, probably with regards to some tree pruning or such like, but there was something in the way he looked at me that made it feel like years. He invited me into the house, an orderly place, filled with the relics of a dozen generations, time-worn photographs and even the odd daguerreotype, a place free of technological aids. The fellow neither owned a fridge nor a wireless. We sat by the coal fire, and he was quick to serve up a cup of tea, laced with scotch. The stuff was foul, but I understood its purpose. He knew I'd come to ask him about his borders. The Calderbanks were the first farmers in Felmont, and they'd laid claim to a sizable portion of land. Their acreage extended from the north end of Winter Air Lane to the edge of the Wilderswood, some two hundred acres or more. I wanted to know if he or any of his predecessors had explored the forest, and or Winter Hill. And of course, he spun a fascinating yarn. I'll do my best to recreate it here. Winter Hill? he said. Aye, once. Our lad mine. The furthest me dad permitted me to hunt were the perimeter line. I'd sit there with rifle and shoot game. One time I winged a pheasant, and being an inquisitive sort of lad, I hopped to at fence and took Wilderswood. I wanted that pheasant summat rotten, and being a fur sort of lad, keen after me dad's philosophy, I didn't want that there bird to suffer at my expense. So I followed it. Up and up into Wilderswood. Dense and dark in there, I couldn't see a thing. But I could hear that bird inching its way through undergrowth. Up and up it went. I took a few pot shots, hoping to finish it off in dark, to grab the little bugger and make me way back down to the farm before me dad caught a whiff of me wandering spirit. But I didn't hit the thing. I just kept on gooing up and up through those oud trees. Calderbank paused once or twice sipping at his tea, wincing, as it made its way down a dry throat. Eventually, he continued, I started to see rays of light sneaking in between trees. I panicked, for I knew I was close to Plateau. I'd heard the stories, Dick, knew what they said about wolves up there, and other wild things. Didn't think I were cut out for hunting those creatures, but I'd be damned if I weren't at least going to try catch that bleeding pheasant. The tree line thinned, and I soon found myself on Bald Hillside, proper moorland, with a couple of hundred feet of slippery, knobbly interlum beneath my feet. But I kept on going, because I could see that bloody pheasant flapping ahead of me, climbing up and up towards someone it was probably much better acclimated to than me. And soon enough, panting away like I don't know what, I crested the hill and reached the plateau. What did you see? I asked. Nout! Couldn't see a bloody thing! Tall plain was mischoked. I'd have been damned if I'd set out across that there plateau. You couldn't seek ground beneath your feet. I felt a little deflated at this stage. I was expecting the old bugger to tell me he saw wolves, big cats, and other out-of-place creatures up there. At the very least, he could have told me that there were strange ruins up there, 
towering beacons like the rambling man spoke of, derelict castles and deserted palaces, reclaimed by mist-dwelling hill-folk. But no, the end of his tale told of something else entirely. So I stood there on the edge of that plain for a good few minutes, squinting like a mad egg, listening for the pheasant. And then the mist started to dissipate somewhat. It did? Aye, and I could see a few paces ahead of me at last. There was nothing remarkable about the geography, Dick. Nobly mounds of grey-green grass and stagnant pools of mud. Nothing remarkable about that whatsoever. But I caught sight of my pheasant. Dead. I mean, I think it were my pheasant. Its wing was clipped and malformed. But it weren't my haphazard shooting that the thing had succumbed to. No, its head were missing. It was? Aye. And somewhere off in that dissipating mist I heard a distinct chewing and crunching. I figured there were wolves out there, and I were keen to be off that plateau as fast as me little legs could carry me to tell me dad what a silly bugger had been, and to welcome his punishments with open arms. An hour off, running down that knobbly hillside with my rifle raised above my head like a mad feller. Old Norman paused again, sipping his tea. But it was what I heard on the wind as I crossed back into the Wilderswood that drove me home like a bolt of lightning. What did you hear? I can only describe it as a note, like a musical note, a chord. Like what folk hear at the Wailing Willow. Exactly like that, but louder, more defined, more vocal. It was shrill, but clear enough for me to suggest that its point of origin must have been up there on Plateau. And Calderbank proceeded to tell me how his dad chastised him upon his return, and made him vow never to cross the borderline again, and that winged pheasants were no excuse to go wandering into the Wilderswood. What it was that bit off the head of old Norman's pheasant, he never learned. In discussing the appearance of strangers in Felmont, Calderbank was reticent to offer his suppositions, though he was quick to tie the creature responsible for the killing of his pheasant to the rambling man, whose injuries were suggestive of an encounter with something beyond the safety of the Wilderswood. The old fellow warned against wanders into the hills, just like my dad and his dad before him had, but he offered no guess as to how the strangers could have made their way up there in the first place. I'm happy to admit it now. My curiosity had been piqued, and if folks kept turning up in the village, I felt a journey up onto that plateau would be inevitable at some stage. Entry 6. Tuesday, December 31st, 1957. No further reports of strangers in Felmont were reported on New Year's Eve. But it was the report of something else that terrified the community. The report of three children down by Devil's Bridge. An encounter with something all too reminiscent of old Calderbank's boyhood tale. Devil's Bridge, for those unfamiliar with these parts, is what remains of an old wooden footbridge on the edge of the Wilderswood, just south of the village. Kids have always explored the perimeter down there, because you can dam up the old brook and even swim in the warmer months. But crossing the old bridge is forbidden, as are most routes into the Wilderswood, for reasons I've touched upon several times now. They say the bridge is named after the creature that used to dwell there, or at least was supposed to dwell there, a thing that used to go after hunters who had strayed into the ravine, chasing rabbits and such like. It was a deformed goat, they say, a thing that had learned to walk on two legs. You'd be deep in the ravine, up to your eyes in shit, and you'd catch sight of a pair of eyes gazing at you through the thickets. You'd straighten your back to get a better look, and up it'd go with you, up onto its hooves, and then it'd chase you the hell out of there. And it wasn't just the hunters who saw the devil of the ravine. Woodsmen saw it too, one of whom was my own dad. He'd been in the brook, he said, frolicking with his pals, in and out of the water, having a gay old time. When before he knew it, something else had jumped into the man-made pool with him. The devil, they'd all cried out, 
and fled from what they described as a half-man, half-goat, trotting along behind them as fast as its misshapen legs could carry it. The farmers saw it, the dog-walkers saw it. There was a time when having not seen it marked you as odd. In the end, they say the thing was shot and killed, later fed to the pigs up at Naylor's farm. And so you have to conclude that the thing the three children say they saw down by the old bridge on New Year's Eve had to be something other than the devil of the ravine. The children in question comprised Derek Smith's boy, Mark, the youngest of Sylvia Davis's brood, I forget her name, and Bobby Thomas, the greengrocer's Alan and Ginger's eldest. What I heard down at the willow, from the mouth of Mark Smith's father, was that the boy had pulled an old mudguard off one of Big Mick's decommissioned tractors, and along with Bobby and the girl, the three of them had fled with it in the direction of the Wilderswood, eager to ride the steep embankments down by Devil's Bridge. And that's where they'd ended up, the three of them taking turns in that old mudguard, up and down the slope. For twenty minutes or so, the scene was a simple one, three kids playing in the ravine. But then, the girl got a little too big for her boots, and ended up carried a little too far down the slope, and crashed headlong into the frozen brook below. Mark and Bobby rushed after her, slipping and sliding, and all the while she lay in the fractured ice, tossing and turning, struggling to climb to her feet, and as those lads jumped into the ice to retrieve her shivering frame, the three of them heard the first of several footsteps, heavy thuds, they said, crashing down upon the rotten timbers of Devil's Bridge. It had come down from the woods, they added. The old bridge was right above their heads as they struggled in the icy waters, and from that vantage point all they could see was a dark, looming figure, the crash of its boots sending flurries of snow down upon them. And it salivated, they said. Mark and Bobby screamed and screamed, overwhelmed by the situation, for the young girl seemed to tap into an inner strength, and somehow overcame her fright. She pulled her weaker companions up out of the brook, and the three of them made it back onto solid ground. But the thing, dark and menacing it was, loomed in their peripheral vision, seemingly rooted to the spot in the centre of Devil's Bridge, silently calling to them, willing those kids to turn and gaze upon it, whatever it was. Collectively, they overcame that urge, and together they managed to ascend the icy embankment, and made it back to the village, a little worse for wear. When Derek was through talking, I couldn't help but visualise that thing standing on the bridge down there, I instinctively knew it had some connection to the strange visitors we'd been seeing in the village, though for the very first time I felt a supernatural element was attached, something relating to the Wilderswood and that peculiar plateau beyond. It was clear to me that whatever those children had seen, it had come from the very place those strangers had come. What were they? Messengers sent forth to warn of stranger, darker things to follow? And that their being on the bridge, some sort of sentinel? I felt we were on the cusp of something beyond our reckoning, something ready to rock the quiet village of Felmont to its very core. And I wasn't the only one. You should have seen the looks on the faces of Baxter, Brown, Chapman, and Paycock as the cobbler Derrick Smith spun his yarn. Interjection by Philip Anforth, son of Richard Before we continue with entry number seven, I wanted to share some of the thoughts I had had whilst reading my father's words. These thoughts, chiefly, relate to memory. Even before the contents of my father's cabinet had been revealed to me, I had long suspected he was filled with secrets. He was so aloof, so quiet, and my mother, she was much the same, forever in his shadow. They loved me, loved me unconditionally, but there was that inscrutable something that made family life difficult for the three of us. 
and when finally I laid my eyes upon the old journal and that other item in the wooden box, things began to stir in the deepest recesses of my mind. I felt I had seen the journal before, perhaps as my father was penning it, or as he was locking it away in the cabinet. Vague recollection surrounded that leather-bound booklet, some of which took more definitive shape as I sat and read those early entries. The pale man, the rambling man, the gatekeeper, the tunnel, the devil of the ravine, and, of course, the Wilderswood and Winter Hill, locations well known to me in the twenty-first century, locations well known to many, I imagine, dog-walkers, hikers, photographers, you name it. Upon first mention of those old hills in that journal, I felt my eyes drawn towards Winter Hill, wondering if whatever it was my father had been so afraid of was still out there, shuffling from crag to ravine, wreathed in mist, waiting, hunting, for folk were still known to disappear every now and then, and their bodies weren't always found. I wondered how much I had seen as a boy, how much I had witnessed over those twelve days. Some of my earliest memories are of the snow, of being held in my father's arms, looking up at my mother before a roaring fire, her face warm but pale, alert but sullen, cries in the night, the howling of dogs, a fire in the sky. Memories? Or was the diary fueling my imagination? As I prepared to read entry number seven, a sense of dread filled my belly. But further recall would surely help to clarify my muddled memories, wouldn't it? But the horrors my parents endured were about to haunt me, as they had haunted them for over half a century. So continues the journal of Mr. Richard Peter and forth. Entry number seven, Wednesday, January 1st, 1958. A new year was upon the village of Felmont, but thoughts of goodwill to all men were far from our minds. There were no New Year's Eve celebrations the night before. We were all too shaken by recent events to partake in excessive drinking and the singing of Auld Lang Syne. We wanted to be at home, warm by the fire, in the company of family. We wanted to forget about the three strangers, and the thing that had stoked the children down by Devil's Bridge. And as far as New Year's Eve was concerned, our wishes were granted. As for New Year's Day, well... The morning of the first was quiet, owing to a fresh and vast blanket of snow. I mean, I couldn't even open the door. I'd had to squeeze out of a window in the study and clear the snow away with a coal shovel. It took what felt like an eternity. The resulting snow pile took on a life of its own, I can tell you. I was more than a little relieved when I finally made it back inside. It was a damnably cold day, the kind of chill that takes hold of the bones. I ate breakfast, drank several cups of tea, courtesy of Murray, and spent many an hour gazing out across the snow, my inquisitive stir consistently drawn to the Wilder's Wood and the hazy hills beyond. I had to get down to the Wailing Willow, had to catch up with the other regulars. What if something else had happened overnight? I needed to be in the loop, had to know. Again, I stepped out into the biting cold, cowered as I passed that sinister snow pile, and trudged my way in the direction of High Bank. Big Mick hadn't been out in his tractor, and so the roads were thick with the white stuff. It was quite the hike just to get from Stump Road to the pub. And the streets were utterly deserted. Can't say I blame folk for wanting to stay at home, given the rumours floating around the village. I reached the willow, bashed the snow from my boots, and was welcomed into the warmth by Chapman, Paycock, Baxter, of course, Derrick Smith and Alan Thomas, the latter two still hell-bent on knowing who or what their kids had encountered down by Devil's Bridge. 
Big Mick was standing at the bar too, waxing lyrical about his problematic tractor. It was playing silly bug, as he said, and was going to be out of service till he could get it into Bolton for spur parts. With nobody to clear the roads, we knew we'd be effectively cut off from the outside world till the local authority could send up a plough from Bolton. But we resigned ourselves to a couple of weeks of isolation, determined to resolve what to a number of us was becoming a troublesome situation. It was just as Chapman placed a pint of ale before me that we heard the sinister, agonising cry of the willow outside. We rushed outside into the freezing cold, the seven of us, into the path of that damnable piping, just in time to watch the last of the snow blown from the limbs of the gatekeeper as the gust exhausted itself. The wail once again faded to a whisper, and as it did so, our eyes fell upon the tunnel beyond, out of which came hurtling towards us a pack of wolves? Huge creatures they were, heading straight for us, their mighty paws light upon the snow, moving with a swiftness hitherto unseen. Dark and menacing, their grey coats shimmered in the haze, their deep crimson eyes focused on the object of their pursuit, which, at that time, we could only assume was the seven of us. At Chapman's command we dashed back inside, bolted the door, and rushed to the rear window. Much to our surprise, the pack had halted by the gatekeeper. We saw now that there were five of them, crouched next to the willow. It was a little easier to estimate their size. And I have to tell you, those beasts were massive. The size of bulls they were, and strangely silent, their heads sweeping from left to right, searching. Chapman whispered something about the snowhounds of the plateau, the very creatures he'd been banging on about just a day or two earlier, feeling vindicated, I reckon. And I have to admit, he had the right to feel that way. And then we watched with mixed awe and terror, as right before our eyes, Pat Ferris, one of the town's most senior residents, seemed to appear out of nowhere and ambled in the direction of the willow, and the five beasts hunkering beneath its naked branches. Ferris, ninety-four, suffered from dementia, and was often found wandering the streets at all times a year in search of God knows what. January 1st, 1958, was to mark the end of his wandering days. It happened so quickly that none of us window-hoggers had the time to water even a syllable. Pat had yelled incoherently in the direction of the hounds, and in response, one of their number, the biggest of the bunch, separated itself from the pack and pounced. The beast practically sailed through the air, its jaws opening as it went, revealing a mouthful of razor-sharp teeth. I've never seen a mouth open so wide. The thing came down on Ferris with such force and ferocity that it swallowed the poor bloke's head entirely, before gnawing through the frail skin of his neck and crunching violently as his decapitated body fell to the ground, the deep red blood of some ninety-four years adding colour to an otherwise monochrome scene. A surreal scene, I might add. Picture it, the seven of us, our faces glued to the glass of that window, our eyes fixed upon the mutilated body of Mr. Ferris, the giant snowhound and its pound of flesh, and those hellish counterparts stooped in the shadow of the gatekeeper. Baxter screamed. Derek Smith collapsed. The rest of us just gawped as the monster returned to the willow, its cavernous mouth chewing and crunching. As the beastly alpha swallowed what remained of its snack, the rest of the pack made for Pat's body. We watched, mortified, as those beasts dragged what remained of Ferris back into the tunnel and disappeared into the haze of the Wilderswood. The horror was otherworldly. Entry number 8, Thursday, January 2nd, 1958. 
Ordinary life had been suspended in Felmont. The news of the attack on the elderly Pat Ferris had spread through the village like wildfire. Folk were frightened, scared to step outside, afraid of what might be lurking on the snowy streets. And so the afternoon of January 2nd, we called for a meeting down at the village hall to discuss our circumstances in detail, as well as the expected faces of Big Mick, Chapman, Paycock, and the like. I was surprised to see old Calderbank ambling down Winter Air Lane in the direction of the village hall. Young Jack Robbins had alerted him, he said. And several dozen other folk turned up, Bert Roberts, Davy Atkins, Janet Harris, and her brood, plus the usual suspects ordinarily propping up the bar at the Willow, namely Baxter, Frank Castle, Betty Walters, and her husband Pete, and a few others whose names I can't recall at present. There, in the spacious conference room, surrounded by the portraits of our forebears, we discussed our newly discovered isolation, and soon learned that as well as Big Mick and his tractor troubles, we had telephony issues to contend with. The few folk in attendance with telephones at home each reported problems with the landlines. I was ninety-nine per cent certain that the extreme weather was to blame, but I just couldn't help but feel that both this and Big Mick's engine problems were directly related to the developing phenomenon. Mick, bless him, was eager to make the journey into Bolton on foot, in order to get his hands on a plough, but folk were dead against it. The general consensus was that we should stick together, lock ourselves up at home, and wait for the local authority to cotton on to our situation. But who could say how long it would take them to cotton on? We're independent folk, we Felmonters. We've never come up against anything we haven't been able to take care of ourselves. The post office bandits are fifty-two, the Bixby fire are forty-nine, all dealt with swiftly and cleanly, without the intervention of outsiders. This was no different. It was clear to me that a mounting threat was upon us, and that if we didn't take action against it, we'd fall prey to it. Would there be anything left worth rescuing if we simply sat about awaiting rescue? I doubted it, as did many others. And so I proposed an expedition. Off we'd go, I said. A small group of us, past the gatekeeper, through the tunnel, and up onto Winter Hill, to take care of whatever it was that had sent those strangers into the village, and whatever it was that had made a meal of frail old Mr. Ferris. Naturally, folk opposed me, finding such an idea preposterous, unrealistic, they said. For who could say what we might find up there? How could we be sure we'd have the strength and numbers to overcome it? Well, if there's one thing I've learned over the years, it's that nothing's certain in these lives we live. Sometimes you've just got to take a risk. That's all there is to it. But I had my supporters, too. Calderbank grinned and offered his rifle. Big Mick said he'd be there with bells on. Derek Smith, whose son had had that encounter with Uno's walk down by Devil's Bridge, was more than happy to join our ranks. Chapman wanted to sign up and close the willow for a day. Even the drunk Baxter was more than happy to trade the bottle for a shotgun, if vengeance for old Ferris we could exact. And Mrs. Blanche, the headmistress over at Felmont County Primary School, threw her name into the mix. To me, it was a done deal. With seven names in the hat, I was about to suggest we draw up a plan of action, when Murray appeared in the doorway, a look of exasperation on her face. And she wasn't alone. She held the trembling hand of a small child, a boy of some four or five years of age, wrapped from head to toe in winter wear, blue in the face. I approached Murray and the boy tentatively, and listened as she told me of her encounter with him on Winter Air Lane. She'd been walking in the direction of the village hall, when she'd spotted the little fella trudging through the snow in the middle of the road. From his tracks, she saw that he'd wandered from the direction of High Bank, and presumably had come down from out of the Wilder's Wood like the other strangers. I brought the boy into the room and sat him down before the open fire on the far wall. Dr. Brown was among our number, and in a cursory fashion was able to establish that the boy was unharmed. He had no words for us, 
but he smiled aplenty. What a handsome little devil he was, the bluest eyes he had, and a healthy head of bright blonde curly hair. And unlike the other strangers who had made their way into the village, the child had a smile for everybody. No blank stir, no incoherent rambling, just an overwhelmingly pleasant manner that everybody in the room found infectious. He brightened our spirits, that lad did, and his presence went a long way to convincing the rest of the assembly that an expedition to Winter Hill was in Felmont's best interests. The sudden appearance of this mysterious child only furthered my desire to get up onto those moors, to see what on earth was happening up there, to put an end to these weird visitations once and for all. The village of Felmont had never seen such strangeness. Stranded as we were, Dr. Brown accepted mine and Mary's suggestion of having the boy stay with us until we could get the little blighter into Bolton. We adjourned the meeting, and made plans to reconvene the following morning, just the seven expedition members, Calderbank, Big Mick, Derrick Smith, Chapman, Baxter, and Mrs. Blanche. Mary and I took the boy home with us, and saw to his needs. Upon removing his thick winter coat, we found something in its inside pocket. Whatever it was, it immediately reminded me of the thing I'd glimpsed on the wrist of the first stranger back on Boxing Day. It was a small rectangular box with numbers on the front, the size of a cigarette case, approximately. I figured it was a pocket torch or something, but I'd never seen its like before. Perhaps in time, the boy will know what to do with it. Leaving the lad in Mary's capable hands, I spent the remainder of the day in the study, poring over old books and newspaper clippings my dad and his dad before him had collected over the decades. I studied the history of the region and outdated ordnance survey maps, Boltonian folklore and local ghost stories, the records of land barons and wealthy entrepreneurs. Even the book Notes on the Industrial Revolution found itself under my scrutiny, but nothing whatsoever shed any tangible light on what might have been responsible for what we were experiencing in the village. The report of a Scottish travelling merchant shot in the back in the early nineteenth century made for some interest in reading but the story was told via the pages of a history of true crime in the Northwest, and other than the fact that the murder had taken place on the moors, it held nothing of the supernatural about it. I left the study feeling dejected, a little frustrated, hadn't learned a thing. But we had the boy in our company, and I figured he might be able to help me with my inquiries and so I approached him, sitting there on the couch with Murray, enjoying the warmth of the fire, a pile of biscuits in front of him. But despite my best efforts to rouse him, it was clear his little Ed wasn't quite ready to give up its secrets. Perhaps it were those biscuits that had his tongue. I left him and Murray to it. The lad had been through enough. Perhaps something of value could be gleaned during the meeting, on the morrow. Entry number nine, Friday, January 3rd, 1958. The morning of January 3rd was quite unusual, I have to tell you. The boy was up at the crack of dawn with me, and I can still recall with perfect clarity the look on his little face as we sat before the fire, each of us clutching a mug of tea. I toasted a couple of slices of bread over the fire, and lathered them with butter. The boy ate that toast like a wild one. The Christmas tree was still up, and the boy kept looking up at it curiously. Murray had done a marvellous job decorating the thing. It shone all colours, but she'd neglected to pull the thing down on New Year's Day, as was our routine, due to recent events in the village. But I have to admit, there was something comforting about it still being up. Me and the boy sat there in the warmth, the snow of an aggressive winter hugging the cottage, hot tea and buttery toast. It would have been easy to forget about everything that had happened, to forget about the pale man, the dead man, the rambling man, 
and the attack on poor Pat Ferris. Still, there was nothing ordinary about the situation. There I was, sat with a child who had wandered into the village just the day before, no identification, no words to share with us, sat before a Christmas tree that had been up too long, and there in the back of my mind, I was contemplating what was assuredly a terrible idea, that expedition up onto Winter Hill. I left the boy in the hands of Mary just after ten a.m. She saw that he ate something more substantial than toast, and said she'd give him a proper tour of the cottage, and even a glance over the back garden, weather permitting. The second meeting at the village hall had been set for 10.15 a.m., and I was pleased to discover that my fellow adventurers were there to greet me when I trudged up to the old doors at ten past. There they were. I can see the faces now. Old Calderbank and Big Mick, bless them. Derrick Smith, Chapman, Baxter, and Mrs. Blanche. The seven of us stood there on the threshold up to our knees in snow, Cut a peculiar picture, I can tell you. We headed on into the conference room, to find that the fire was already blazing, and an assortment of drinks and snacks had been laid out on the table, courtesy of John Michael, the vicar. John, a middle-aged fellow who always seemed to smell a turpentine for some reason, excused himself and left the seven of us to it. Calderbank, an all-nonsense sort of bloke, surprised us by whipping out a weathered map of Felmont, a map showing the acreage comprising the Wilderswood north of the Wailing Willow. The map had to hark back to the nineteenth century. Its gnarly edges spoke of untold years at the bottom of a pile of forgotten papers. Curiously, the old willow behind the pub had the word gatekeeper scribbled next to it, and a clearly defined trail through the Wilderswood beyond was labelled Tunnel. "'Found it with land deeds,' Calderbank said. "'Been there for donkey's years.' It was evident that one of his predecessors had been familiar with the route through the woods, so familiar, in fact, that he or she had been able to sketch a crude map. Our discussions turned to the purpose of the proposed expedition. I stated that, in simple terms, it was important to know exactly what was up there, to try to understand what it was that had drove the strangers up there, to hunt those damnable snowhounds to their source, to eliminate them, and all this to keep Felmont safe for future generations. Mrs. Blanche was quick to call me melodramatic, but even quicker to state that my heart was in the right place, and that it really was necessary to take action. Blanche's father had been a hunter, and it was well known throughout Felmont that she too was a crack shot with a rifle and it was at that point that the rest of the group offered up their motivations for volunteering to join me on the expedition. Calderbank, despite his ninety-something years, said he was prepared to risk his bacon due to unfinished business, with whatever it was that decapitated his pheasant some eighty years earlier. Big Mick, the current patriarch of the Naylor family, had farmland and livestock to protect. Derek Smith, of course, as I've already stated, wanted to make sure Devil's Bridge was safe for his son and other young Felmonters. He said he was no longer willing to accept that such places should just be off-limits. Chapman, well, Chapman was just plain curious, I reckon. He was wont to talk ghouls and goblins. The opportunity to see something queer with his own eyes, especially after that their close encounter with those snowhounds, well, he couldn't pass on it. And Baxter— "'Who knows? I reckon he was just plain drunk.' The seven of us discussed firearms and even explosives. Mick said he had a couple of landmines in his possession. At the time, I questioned the use of mines. But I'll say it now. We would have been damned if we had gone up there without those things. We agreed to pool our resources, gather whatever we deemed safe to carry— and head out onto the moors at first light the following day. Calderbank, Big Mick, and Mrs. Blanche were in charge of supplying the firearms, namely a couple of rifles and a shotgun. Derek Smith, cobbler by trade, would supply seven pairs of snowshoes in order to make the journey up onto that barren and presumably snow-covered moor more tolerable. 
Chapman said he'd handle the food prep, though what he meant by that was that he'd have Helen prepare the required provisions for the journey. Myself, a humble woodsman, well, I'd bring along an axe, a couple of knives, firelight in paraphernalia, the whole bushman's package. And Baxter, bless him, would simply be an extra pair of hands. I'm sure, if anything, he'd be armed with a hip flask. In studying Calderbank's map, we noticed what appeared to be a structure of some sort noted on the northernmost edge of the Wilder's Wood, right where the tree line met the edge of the plateau above it. From the description, scrawled in such small lettering that only I could make it out, I determined that the structure was a lookout tower of some description, probably harking back to medieval times. It was labelled Pigeon Tower. That, we all agreed, would be the location of our base camp, should we make it that far. The meeting concluded around lunchtime, the seven of us returning to our various homes in order to get to work preparing for the following day's journey. I ate lunch with Mary and the boy just after noon. I tell you, that kid had done nothing but eat all morning. Famished he was. He still hadn't said anything, though, just kept on smiling at Mary and me, his face caked in breadcrumbs and gravy. Despite all that had happened, and was about to happen the following morning, that child brought a great deal of merriment to our little cottage, and the rest of the day was spent showing the little blighter things. A box of dominoes, a pack of playing cards, he took a special interest in the jokers, the board game Monopoly, and even an old chessboard took his fancy. And by the look on his face as he gazed at those chess pieces, I wouldn't have liked to take him on that afternoon, I tell you. He seemed to recognise most, if not all, of the things we showed him, but he just couldn't seem to find the words to express it. Thrilled as we were to be looking after such a pleasant little chap, I couldn't help but wonder about his parents. Worried out of their minds they must have been. And where were they? In a neighbouring village, a neighbouring town? We had no way of knowing. And there was little, if anything, we could do about it, until we'd done away with whatever it was that had come from Winter Hill. Entry number 10. Saturday, January 4th, 1958. I won't bore you with talk a Saturday morning, Mary, me, and the boy— Another meal by the fire, you know the drill by now. But it is important to state that I barely slept, and was up, along with Murray and the lad, at 5 a.m., before heading out into the frigid cold to take care of business. I met the others outside the village hall at 5.30, with the exception of Baxter, who stumbled into the conference room at ten to six. I tell you— the alcohol on his breath were potent enough to intoxicate the rest of us. Regarding supplies, Calderbank, Big Mick, and Mrs. Blanche each carried sizable backpacks, the butts of rifles and shotguns sticking out above their heads. Mick was quick to introduce us to the two landmines he had acquired following the war. I don't mind admitting it. I didn't like the look of those things one bit. Derek Smith unveiled his snowshoes, and I have to say, they were a good fit. I don't think any of us had trouble slipping into them. That is, once again, with the exception of Baxter, whose ability to stand upright was severely impaired. Chapman, by way of Helen, had brought enough food and drink to satiate a small army, and I think that, more than anything, put our minds at ease. That just left my modest provisions, the axe, the knives, flint and steel, a tarpaulin, and a couple of boxes of matches for good measure. And so there we were, seven commoners, about to set out on a journey into the unknown. Only Calderbank had set foot up there before, but, the mere child he was, his recollections, as he had shared with me earlier in the week, were vague at best. Nevertheless, far as this journey was concerned, we'd be following a map into those old hills— in the direction of what we hoped would still be there, the Pigeon Tower. We talked over the details for an hour or so, slowly awaiting first light. We mused over the nature of the snowhounds, 
and whether or not meagre bullets would be enough to bring them down. Derrick Smith repeatedly reminded us that the thing his son had encountered down by Devil's Bridge had been no hound, that, according to the three of them that day, it sounded as though the thing were wearing boots. So unless those things were werewolves, I expected we'd encounter more than just hounds up there, on Winter Hill. But whatever was out there, we had to feel confident in our combined abilities to deal with it, or else the expedition would be futile, just a blind gambit. We had to feel that the hunt was justified, that what we were protecting back in Felmont was worth the risk. And in the end, I think we managed to convince each other of that. At around 7am, some of us had developed itchy feet, and were eager to set off. We argued that the snowy terrain would provide the requisite illumination, and so we took the decision to set out at 7.30, in the direction of High Bank. And set out we did. Smith's snowshoes made the going a little easier. We covered the half-mile from the village hall to the Wailing Willow in just under ten minutes. But the pub might as well not have been there. Our eyes were drawn to the gatekeeper, standing taller than it ever had its branches white with snow, truly living up to its name, there in the shadow of the Wilderswood. I think we all shuddered, each of us silently awaiting that wail, the wail that would drive us back, the way it had driven all those others back over the long years, those who had set out so bravely into the wilderness, only to flee as that horrible discord assailed their frostbitten ears. But the tree didn't wail, Thank God it didn't, for I reckon we would have bailed just like the others. We pressed on, past the gatekeeper, under its protective limbs, and beyond, into the spectral, strangely luminescent Wilderswood. It was deadly silent under those old oaks and sycamores. Not a sound penetrated the scene, other than the crunching of fresh snow beneath our feet, and we were unprepared for the gradient of that hike up through the tunnel. Old Norman puffed and wheezed as he went, and we were mindful to match his stride. A man of ninety-something years has to be cautious when out in the wild, and I'm thankful that was the case. To climb too quickly would have been to climb foolishly. We had to keep our ears peeled for movement out there in the forest, to be aware of whatever might have eyes on us in the shadowy wilder's wood just like the thing that had eyed the rambling man, prior to taking a bite out of him. Up and up we went, just as a sprightlier colder bank had done decades earlier, occasionally eyeballing the old map he'd found amongst the land eats, up and up in the direction of the Pigeon Tower. If I recall correctly, we reached that old ruin at approximately 2 p.m., and a good thing too, as we'd ascended a good thousand feet or more and the temperature had dropped considerably. The pigeon tower was little more than a pile of rubble. A sizable portion of rear wall remained, and at the very least would provide some shelter from the ghastly gale that seemed to be blowing down from the bald hills above. A lookout tower it assuredly had once been, but its days of utility were well and truly over. We needed to rest, and that meant we needed a fire. I rummaged through my backpack in search of my firelighting kit. We shoveled snow here and there, and quickly unearthed a decent amount of firewood. Clearing further snow from out of what remained of the pigeon tower, we piled the twigs and branches there, by the old wall. I brought kindling to the pile, and ignited it with flint and steel. Before we knew it, we were sat with our backs against that wall, our arms extended towards the blaze. And then we heard it, subtle and muted at first, a whistling, a whistling that soon became a moaning, a moaning that rapidly became a wailing, the wailing of the willow, far below us. That harsh wind at our backs was driving its way down through the wilder's wood, exhausting itself in the old tree down by the pub, and we were closer to the source of that unearthly wind than ever before. I don't think any of us spoke. We didn't want to acknowledge it verbally. We simply sat by the fire, gathering our strength for the final climb. 
Winter Hill was but a few hundred feet above our frozen heads, but it would have been foolhardy to attempt to climb the rest of the way that afternoon. Calderbank was absolutely shattered, and needed more than a couple of hours to recover. And so we decided to cook up some of the foodstuffs Chapman had brought along, and to establish a proper base camp by erecting the tarpaulin over the remains of the pigeon tower. We even managed to improvise a sort of smoke flue, to prevent us from choking to death in the night. Given our lack of sleep the previous night, we all felt it prudent to get as much rest as possible. We simply couldn't afford to stumble out onto that plateau in various states of disrepair. The rest of the afternoon and evening was spent, under the relative comfort of that tarpaulin. Each of us sprawled out upon mats of varying size, engaged in card games, accompanied by one too many shots of rum, courtesy of Baxter. Strangely, it was quite the party atmosphere in there, each of us sharing stories of yesteryear, each of us continually outdone by old Norman, whose wisdom and experience was unparalleled. Eventually things settled down, and I reduced the fire to embers, in order to keep things manageable throughout the night. We had opted to sleep in shifts, as we all felt it necessary to keep watch at all times. I was out cold in a matter of seconds. Some time after midnight, I awoke to the curious sensation of Mrs. Blanche prodding me in the back. Roused, she placed a finger over my lips to ensure my silence, and we listened, the two of us, as a distant chorus howled in the night. The snowhounds were nearby, probably attracted to the smoke billowing from our hastily improvised shelter and the lingering scent of the food we had consumed. How foolish we were to cook food over the fire with such potential threats nearby. But fortunately, the howls faded into the night, and we all managed to get some rest, before rising again at five a.m. for that fateful journey up onto Winter Hill. Entry number 11. Sunday, January 5th, 1958. Rested and somewhat reinvigorated, we armed ourselves with the basic essentials, firearms and foodstuffs, and set out into the snowy darkness. The relative warmth of the wilder's wood behind and below us, our snowshoes made first contact with the bald hills, which, of course, on that particular Sunday, were anything but bald, blanketed by yet another snowfall. That interminable gale was still blowing, but it lacked the fierceness of the winds of the previous day. It seemed to whisper in our direction, passing through us, a gentle warning. Old Norman was struggling again. We'd been en route less than an hour when he started to puff and wheeze. Baxter felt the most logical remedy for Calderbank's ailment was a swig of the stuff in his hip flask. It was vodka that morning, I believe. But we kept on going, up and up, as we had the day before. The haze above was ever-present, enigmatic it was, like a veil suspended in the air. I'd fashioned several pairs of snow glasses out of the remains of a cardboard box, not exactly the height of fashion, but practical enough to ensure at least limited visibility. I'd found myself lost in the snow before. Snow blindness was a burden we could do without that morning. Mrs. Blanche was the first to spot what we encountered next. It seemed to be a glove protruding from the snow some ten feet or so ahead of us. Upon further inspection, we were dismayed to discover that the glove belonged to a hand, and that the hand wasn't attached to an arm. To whom that hand had once belonged, we were unable to determine, though Mrs. Blanche said we should hold on to the glove should it ever be attached to future reports of missing persons. That blue, stiff appendage appeared to have been gnawed off, abandoned, in favour of the larger morsel it had been separated from. More evidence to suggest that the much-feared snow owns were active in the area, and further evidence to suggest that another hapless wanderer had met his or her doom up there on the moors. We continued, 
After some two hours or so of climbing, things changed, quite abruptly, I might add. The sort of change you might compare to sunshine after a thunderstorm. When the last of the raindrops have fallen upon the hard earth, and those first inimitable rays penetrate the dispersing clouds. That illumination is quite shocking at first, overwhelming in the way it pours colour onto a once darkened scene. The change we experienced was just like that. The whistling wind all but ceased, the haze above began to dissipate, and even the depth of the snow beneath our shoes shallowed, and between one step and the next, we found ourselves walking on the frozen earth of Winter Hill. Within a matter of minutes we'd crested that there hillside, and found ourselves standing atop a crag, overlooking the plateau, at least as much as we could see of it. Clouds of mist danced spectrally across the landscape, obscuring the view. I heard Calderbank's voice in the back of my mind. There was nothing remarkable about the geography, Dick. Nobbly mounds of grey-green grass and stagnant pools of mud. Nothing remarkable about that whatsoever. And that's precisely what we saw, as the veils of fog waxed and waned. Myriad mounds and colourless shrubbery, dirty brown bogs and moss-covered pools, a sight probably seen atop every moorland expanse across the United Kingdom. But there were other things out there in the mist. We saw colourful objects, items of clothing and backpacks, flasks and broken walking sticks. We saw bones, bones everywhere, belonging to all creatures great and small, animal and human. Figures ambled just out of sight, shapes belonging to things vast and furry, tall and dark, beings that walked on all fours, Creatures that shuffled on two legs. Not a sound could be heard, other than the faintest, most distantly audible piping or droning emanating from a central point across the obscured plateau. Quite suddenly, Mrs. Blanche drew a rifle and unloaded several cartridges into something creeping towards us in the mist. We heard an agonised yelping, that of a dog, and we all listened attentively as it shuffled away into the boggy hinterland. Distant growls were heard from the throats of multiple creatures, growls loud and growls restrained. Each of us cocked our weapons and waited. Something a stone's throw away hollered in our direction, and it flew towards us. Calderbank cocked his rifle and took it down. The thing let out an appalling yowl, and we collectively held our breath as the thing came tumbling out of the haze and fell to its knees before us. "'The devil of the ravine!' cried Calderbank, and it looked just like what I'd heard described as a boy, half man, half goat, just as my father had described it, and Calderbank had blown an almighty hole in its humanoid chest. The sound it emitted was akin to wooden chairs dragged across stone floors, dozens of individual utterances assaulting our ears. Big Mick cocked his shotgun and filled the thing's head with buckshot. It fell backwards then, collapsing into a heap some ten feet or so ahead of us. I watched as the blood and grey matter pooled behind it, and listened as those distant growls, both loud and restrained, seemed to retreat in every direction. Things fell silent after that. I think we almost have wanted to debate what we'd seen, to understand what had been shot and killed, and I think every one of us wondered how many more of those goat things might be out there, alongside the snowhounds, and God knows what else. But we didn't have time to debate it. We had to press forward, had to locate the source of that distant droning, a piping which had now grown in intensity, a wailing now accompanied by that shrill, whistling wind. That wind bellowed, and somewhere out there on the plateau we heard the howls of the snowhounds and the cackling of other things impossible to define. With the rising of the wind, 
came the dissipation of the mist, almost entirely, and we found ourselves, at last, face to face with the entirety of Winter Hill, the complete expanse, some ten miles square, unobstructed, uninterrupted. And out there, negotiating the mounds and the crags, the bogs and the pools, we saw the mist folk and the goblins, the goat men and the snow hounds, innumerable bodies, both animal and human. Chapman yelled, The little men of County Bravadus, as we spied a group of gnome like humanoids, and then watched as they dropped into a ravine and out of sight. Calderbank gasped in horror as a bird the size of a tree spread its enormous wings and flew into the icy air. And each of those ghastly beings, every last one of those horrible creatures, was drawn towards something out there on the great plateau, something hanging in the air above Winter Hill. But it wasn't an airship, a helicopter, or any man-made thing that we, of even the simplest intelligence, might recognise. It was just a mass, an, an enormous black window in the sky. And as those otherworldly creatures approached it, they disappeared, one by one, as though drawn into it by forces unseen, back to wherever it was they had come from. Derek Smith, a look of determination in his fiery eyes, threw off his snowshoes and set out running across the plateau in the direction of the window. Each of us followed suit, and even old Norman moved with a grace and swiftness hitherto unseen. The window was a mere mile or so ahead of us, but it was just so dreadfully vast. The size of a... well, what can you compare to a shapeless black mass in the sky? A football pitch? A gathering of clouds? Imagine the clear night sky after midnight. Take your finger and trace a dozen stars. Two dozen. Three dozen. Imagine that portion of night sky hovering above you on a clear afternoon, glued to the horizon, but entirely starless. That's the only way I know how to describe it. My heart was beating outside of my chest as we approached that thing, and as we got closer and closer, I somehow found myself drawn to it, much in the way those myriad creatures must have been. And yet the wind continued to increase, the droning got louder and louder, and we struggled in our efforts to move towards it. We, the mere men of this world, battling to approach it. Them, the things of that other world, practically consumed by it. And there they were in the distance, those things disappearing into thin air. Big Mick was yelling to Calderbank. We have to blow it up, he cried. We have to blow it up, he kept repeating. From where we stood, there among the crags and the bogs, I couldn't see how that thing could be reached, let alone destroyed. But Mick and old Norman were adamant, and somehow the two of them managed to push ahead of the rest of us, Mick withdrawing the landmines as he did so. I'd lost sight of Baxter. I figured he'd fallen by the wayside some time ago, but we just didn't have the time to go back for him. We collect him afterward, if we survive the thing whatever it was. And then we reached the edge of the phenomenon. I call it the edge, because we'd reached what appeared to be some sort of barely visible membrane, a layer of film between us and the window. Despite the droning and the howling wind driving us back, we were able to pass through that invisible wall. It yielded to our bodies like smoke. And there on the other side, the window in the sky had taken on a subtle translucency, and we could see things beyond. We stopped there at the edge, gazing into the blackness, which now held the image of a structure, a tall, thin tower dominating the moorland. And I recalled the words of the rambling man, who had claimed to have been drawn to a distant beacon, a tower of some kind that guided him across the moors. But I couldn't take it in, none of it. The scene was much too surreal for my simple mind to process, and I think the others were of a similar mindset. We wanted this thing to be over, and Big Mick and Calderbank were way ahead of us. My memory fails me when I 
try to fully recall what happened next. Derek, Chapman, Baxter, and Mrs. Blanche all concur. Something about what happened next affected our ability to recall. Something to do with our proximity to that window, I reckon. Which went a long way to explaining the amnesia affecting the pale man, the rambling man, and the boy, for example. As I sit here now and think back, I can see Mick and Calderbank in slow motion, running headlong in the direction of that black mass. Mick runs left, Calderbank runs right. Each of them are clutching a landmine. They're some fifty feet apart now, beneath the eye of that shape in the sky. And I see Mick pointing his rifle, Calderbank pointing his. And that's it. My mind's a blank after that. The five of us, the survivors, remember waking on the plateau, fresh snowfall caught in our bodies. No window in the sky, no goat men, no snow hounds, no Mick, no colder bank. We trudged our way back across Winter Hill in the direction of the tunnel, and somehow managed to retrieve our snowshoes and hiked back to base camp. None of us uttered a word the whole way. We simply crawled under the tarpaulin, lit a fire, and slept. We slept like the dead. Entry number 12, Monday, January 6th, 1958 We woke around 4am that Monday morning, and wasted no time in making our way back to Felmont as fast as our tired legs could carry us. We visited John Michael at the rectory, told him of the casualties, spoke of the thing in the sky, but we were unable to shed any light on what had actually happened. It would be days before we could get into Bolton, and so we would have to grieve and recover on our own terms. Dr. Brown paid us all a visit, and though we were suffering from shock, we'd survived the ordeal physically unharmed. That afternoon, we held a meeting at the village hall, and though folk were saddened to hear of the passing of Mick Naylor and Norman Calderbank, there was also a great sense of relief in learning that the village of Felmont was safe, once again. At least, we hope it's safe. Some folk said they saw lights over Winter Hill that Sunday afternoon. A fire in the sky, they said. But that image, for better or worse, is one I'm unable to recall. And I suppose that marked the end of the whole sordid business. It's difficult to reflect upon, even now, some two months later, but some wounds cut deep. I thought the war had hardened me, but nothing could have prepared me for what I saw up there. The things that came from Winter Hill were beyond reckoning. But, in a weird way, the phenomenon Mick and Calderbank put a stop to up there offered a possible explanation for much of the strangeness Felmont had experienced over the years. The Wailing Willow, the Devil of the Ravine, the Snowhounds, the Little Men of County Bravadas. But the village of Felmont had lost three of its own, Pat Ferris, Mick Naylor, and Norman Calderbank, the last of the family line. And there had been others over the years, many before my time. Perhaps those who died or went missing under mysterious circumstances will now know some peace. For there'll always be unanswered questions. What were those creatures up there? Did we really see what we think we saw? Or was that window in the sky causing hallucinations? altering our perception in some inexplicable way. Perhaps the snowhounds were just wild dogs. Perhaps the devil of the ravine was just a rogue goat. Perhaps the mist folk and the goblins were— Oh, I don't know. It's, it's all too much. But where did the strangers come from? No reports of missing persons have thus far matched their descriptions. Will folk from afar eventually come to Bolton in search of their lost sons and daughters? Will the pale man and the rambling man remain on that isolated ward at Bolton Royal till the day they die? Well, that's enough supposition for a lifetime. As for the boy, Mary and me are fostering him, in an unofficial capacity, I might add. 
in the hope that his parents will eventually come forward to claim him. He speaks a little bit now, mostly on the subject of biscuits, but his smiles are brighter than ever. We've named him Philip, and as long as he's with us, he'll be treated as our own. And when, finally, he gets his hands upon this here journal and that thing we found in his coat pocket, he might be able to learn a little more about who he was before we found him, and where he came from. Pip, my boy, your mother and I love you, and I hope you can forgive us for keeping this secret so long. Farewell for now. Dad. Closure by Philip Anforth, son of Richard. So, there it is, just as my father penned it, a secret never to be told in his lifetime. So much strangeness, so many details. I have to confess, nothing of the sort has ever happened to me during my time here in Felmont, and as I've previously stated, the old hills are no secret these days. But that darkness above the plateau, that window in the sky my father says he saw creatures drawn towards, what about the tower he claims to have glimpsed beyond it? Well, a three hundred metre mast was erected in 1965, some seven years after Felmont witnessed the things that came from Winter Hill. How could he have known about that in 1958, unless he saw it with his own eyes? But all that pales when compared to the revelation, at this late stage in my life, that Richard and Mary Ann Forth were not my real parents. They found me wandering the streets, just like those others, with no memory of my former life. They assumed I was five years old, and even made January 2nd, the day they found me, my birthday. But I could have been four or six, it's, it's impossible to know. Or is it? because now the time has come to address the nature of that other item I found in the wooden box, the very item my father fished from my coat some sixty years ago. He thought it was a pocket torch, a rectangular box with numbers on the front, presumably given to me by parents concerned for my safety in the dark. But that thing is no torch. It's a rectangular box, all right, and it does have numbers on the front but only when connected to Maine's power. Its battery died sixty years ago. In amongst a pile of cables and power cords, I managed to find a mobile phone charger that matched the small port on the bottom of the little box. I plugged it in, and hey presto, the thing lit up, the illuminated image of a charging battery appearing before my eyes. And soon enough, I held in the palm of my hand a charged, Sixty-year-old mobile phone, a familiar enter passcode screen staring me in the face, the same screen my father must have come face to face with back in 1958, the numbers on the front he compared to the glowing thing on the wrist of the pale man, who, like me, must have come from somewhere else, somewhere beyond that window in the sky, somewhere like the present. In a moment of revelation, I scoured the internet in search of missing persons cases, going back twenty years, specifically surrounding individuals lost on or near the moors. And there were dozens, many of whom had been last seen near the Zark, last seen near Devil's Bridge, last seen near the Wilderswood. And there was a boy of five years, Joshua Blackburn, a lad with bright blue eyes and curly blonde hair, who was separated from his parents in the mist atop Winter Hill on January 2nd, 2018. His parents, Jamie and Shanna of Lostock, some ten miles from Felmont, are still holding out hope that he'll be found, for Joshua can be exceptionally quiet, and might not have the means to explain who he is or where he lives. But he's carrying a mobile phone, they say, and hopefully, if it's ever switched back on, the mobile network will alert the family, in order that they may call and make contact with the boy. But that boy is me, a boy of sixty-five years. How do I know for sure? The phone from the wooden box rang today, more than once. The caller was labelled 
Mom and Dad. Thank you for listening today. If you'd like to support our work here at Horror Babble, be sure to check out the video description below, where you'll find links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages, our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time, 